निराधारम मन कृत्वा विकल्पान्न विकल्पेत तदात्म परमात्म भैरवो मृगलोचने और फ्रीइंग द माइंड ऑफ ऑल सपोर्ट वन शुड नॉट अलाउ एनी थॉट टू अराइज देन ओ गजल आइड गॉडस द स्टेट ऑफ भैरव विल बी अटेन्ड वेन द इंडिविजुअल सेल्फ हैज मर्ज्ड इन द एब्सोल्यूट सेल्फ द विज्ञान भैरव तंत्र वन जीरो एट Reality in its simplest form can be seen as a sphere or as an egg. The spherical model can be conceptually divided into two halves: the upper hemisphere and the lower hemisphere. The upper hemisphere is the most subtle. It contains the consciousness, the being, the super soul, and the lower hemisphere is the most visible, the physical body along with pran. The two hemispheres are interconnected by a plane. which is the mind what is mind it is a complex and multifaceted concept that has been the subject of study and debate among philosophers scientists and spiritual thinkers for centuries one way to understand the mind is to consider it a part which has been given to you it is not yours the mind is an accumulation borrowed from various sources from the parents from the neighbors from the teachers from the society from the social media from the libraries its hunger is insatiable continuously absorbing all kinds of information even contradictory ones which may lead to tensions and internal conflicts for instance if one is born into a christian family they might believe from childhood that the earth is 6000 years old as stated in the bible however upon learning in school that the earth is actually 4.5 billion years old both pieces of information are stored in the mind causing conflict and anxiety and inner turmoil and it is impossible for one to decide which way to go one is pulled apart in all directions if somehow he can maintain his balance this is normal insanity insanity is there but it is just the same as everybody else's carl gustav jung The father of analytical psychology remarks, "Show me a sane man and I'll cure him for you." Whenever somebody goes beyond the boundary of normal humanity, he's considered insane. If an individual manages to contain their inner turmoil without causing societal disruption or distress to others, they are deemed sane. In contrast, Eastern psychology asserts that only a yogi can be considered truly sane. Insanity, whether expressed or unexpressed, is still insanity. How then does the mind of a yogi operate? According to Krishna in the Bhagavad Gita, Jatatmanah Prashantasya Paramatma Samahita Shitoshne Sukhadukeshu Tatha Manap Manayo. Or for one who has conquered the mind, the super soul, the being, is already reached, for he has attained tranquility. to such a person happiness and distress heat and cold honor and dishonor are all the same chapter 6 verse 7 yada viniyatam chittamatmanyeva vatishtate nispriha sarvakami bhyo yukta ityuchyate tada or a yogi is one whose mind is mastered and firmly fixed on the being alone free from the craving for all sense enjoyment chapter 6 verse 18 the mind serves as a mediator between our being and body it is a valuable servant but can be a detrimental master when the mind assumes control and starts dictating it leads to a state of insanity however when you are the master and the mind serves as a devoted servant it functions as intended it leads to yoga This is how the mind of a yogi is. Patanjali writes, "Yoga chitta vritti nirodha tada drishtu swarupe vasthanam." Translated, it means that when the mind is controlled and free from fluctuations, you become firmly established in your being. It works both ways. When you're established, rooted in your being, the mind's fluctuations cease, leading to a state of no mind. A yogi. consistently resides in this state of no mind Osho elucidates this idea through an analogy consider a classroom scenario children chit chat make noise 
and run around until the teacher arrives. Instantly, the room falls into silence. The teacher hasn't spoken, but their presence is enough. Similarly, the presence of being causes the mind to seize its chaos. Thoughts dissipate and the mind becomes a pure space. In this state, the being perceives with clarity and insight. In the absence of being, decision-making was full of uncertainty. The mind was torn between conflicting choices and clouded by myriad thoughts. Whether contemplating life-altering decisions or mundane choices, the mind's lack of clarity almost always results in regret. The mind has no clarity. It is clouded by so many thoughts. It is incapable of decision because it is incapable of clarity. Once the mind is silent, once there is a state of no mind, being is very sharp and clear. There is no question of either or. There is no question of choosing. Whatever the being does is choiceless. It simply does that which the clarity allows it to do. It is always right. Just as the mind is always wrong, the being is always right. The mind has two states, 10% conscious and 90% unconscious. After these states, the domain of being begins. The deeper layers of the unconscious mind marks the point where the realms of the mind and being intersect. Therefore, even those who are not yogis can connect with their being to some extent during sleep. Thus, they come to know in their dreams the answers that the mind, no matter how much it thinks, will never be able to give. Many scientists have experienced breakthrough discoveries through ideas that came to them in their dreams. A journalist once asked the renowned physicist Albert Einstein about the secret of his creative process. Einstein replied that there comes a point in the state of sleep when the intellect takes a long leap and reaches the highest level of consciousness. Most scientific breakthroughs in the world have occurred in this state. The famous scientist James Watt discovered a simple method for making spherical balls for a steam engine through the medium of dreams. Whether one believes it or not, it's a fact that solutions to many complex mathematical problems in the field of mathematics have also emerged from the world of dreams. The renowned French mathematician Henri Poincaré, for example, once asked his collaborators around the world whether their inspiration for solving complex mathematical problems came from contemplation or discussion with colleagues. 79% responded that it came through dreams. Dr. Otto Loewe, a German-American pharmacologist awarded the Nobel Prize in 1921 for the discovery of the hormone acetylcholine, acknowledged that the idea came to him in a dream. These are just a few examples. The enlightened man is nothing but the man who functions from his being. One might question how a yogi who has dropped his mind, who remains in the state of no mind, decides what is right and what is wrong. To this, the enlightened one responds, one has to decide what is wrong and right if he lives under the impact of the mind and none of his decisions is going to prove right. Whatever he chooses, he will suffer and he will always look back. Perhaps the other alternative was better. The enlightened man never chooses. He lives in a choiceless awareness. In the light of his awareness, he knows what is right. It is not a question of decision and the moment you know what is right, with your total being, you never repent. Let's use the analogy of a river. Swami Sarvapriyananda used to beautifully illustrate the distinction between the mind of an ordinary person and that of a yogi. The mind of an ordinary person resembles a river after heavy rainfall, brimming with a torrent of ever-changing and fast-moving thoughts. They cannot concentrate on one thing, unable to live in the moment without recalling the past or imagining the future. Just as the water of the river remains muddy, resulting from landslides during the rainy season, the mind of an ordinary person remains impure and foggy, filled with biases and misconceptions. This fogginess prevents them from seeing things as they are. Similar to how muddy water is not safe to drink, the mind of an ordinary person is not safe for themselves or others. Negativities, resentments, 
miseries, anger, dislike and prejudices float around. It gives them no peace and it gives others around them no peace either. It makes them unhappy and makes others around them unhappy. The mind of an ordinary person is dangerous, like the flooded river after a heavy rain with its waves capable of sweeping one away. Crossing such turbulent waters is fraught with danger. Every individual, especially those who are not yogis, has at some point contemplated self-harm. The harm isn't always overt. It often manifests in daily actions, consuming unhealthy food due to compulsion, neglecting exercise because the mind discourages it, struggling with timely sleep, and battling dangerous addictions to drugs and alcohol. Statistics from 2023 reveal that over 700,000 people choose to end their lives each year. That's approximately one life lost every 40 seconds. To put it into perspective, more than 20 people chose to end their lives since you began watching this video. The ordinary mind is dangerous. On the other hand, think of a yogi's mind like a calm winter river. It flows slowly and deliberately, representing the yogi's intentional choice of thoughts they control. Just like the clear winter river surrounded by icy landscapes, the yogi's mind is serene, pure and transparent. This clarity is like clean water, fit for drinking. It reflects the positive and peaceful nature of a yogi's mind, bringing tranquility to themselves and the world around them. Furthermore, the yogi's mind exudes clarity and transparency, much like the clear water river. This transparency allows the yogi to be constantly aware of their true self and perceive the world as it is. In contrast, the mind of an ordinary person, like a muddy post-rain river, clouds perception, hindering clear understanding. The ordinary person tends to see the world through impure preconceived beliefs, superimposing their impurities onto the world. In doing so, they inadvertently superimpose the snake on the rope, remaining enslaved in ignorance forever.